We have heard no news of you since the letter which you wrote to me from Provence on leaving Paris. We learned by the newspapers that the Empress had arrived in Vienna on May 18th. The Emperor continues in good health. We ride and drive and boat a great deal. The Emperor's house has already been greatly improved. We are busy arranging different residences for him in various parts of the island. We are anxious to receive news as early as possible of the health of the Empress and her son. The heat is beginning to make itself felt. Please lay my respects at the feet of the Empress. Signed Bertrand, Porto Ferreo, June 25th, 1814. I received your letter of June 4th a few days ago and yesterday your letter of June 21st. Since the letter you wrote me from Provence, I had no news of you. Your letter of the 4th contained two letters from the Empress to the Emperor, numbered 5 and 6. The preceding ones have not been received. Your letter of the 21st contained another for the Emperor. His answer is being sent off today. Communications not being yet reestablished, His Majesty wrote but little. I imagine that you will soon receive one or two letters which I have written to you. I know that there is a letter from you which I shall no doubt receive very soon underway. If the Empress awaited the answer to her letter in Vienna, the Emperor wishes her not to go to X, and if she has already gone there, not to pass the season there, but to return to Tuscany as quickly as possible, the waters there being the same as X. These springs are nearer to us. We have learned from the newspapers that Monsieur Mara Kalshi was commissioner to Parma for the Emperor of Austria. If you see General Kohler, remember us to him. He is an excellent man, and we have nothing but praise for his conduct towards us. You are thanked for the details which you give us about the King of Rome. They interested us greatly. May the Empress's health soon be reestablished. We often speak about all concerning her. I need not tell you with what interest we read all that you send concerning her occupations and her way of living. I am asking General Rospigliosi to send you this letter by a courier. Receive ETC, ETC, St. Bertrand, Porto Ferrejo, July 3rd, 1814. I have received your letter of June 6th in which you informed us of your departure from Schoenbrunn. We read of your journey through Switzerland in the papers. We are surprised to receive no news of you. The emperor expects the empress for the end of August and wants her to bring his son with her. His majesty has certainly written much more frequently to the emperor, but her letters are probably intercepted by some secondary agent's orders or perhaps by her father's command. At the same time, nobody has any rights over the empress and her son. Madame has arrived in good health. She has already taken up her abode in her house. Although the house is not a handsome one, she has plenty of room and certain comforts. The emperor is wonderfully well. Our amusements are always the same. Certain occupations during the day, in the evening, excursions on horseback, in our carriages, or in a boat. The heat has been felt for some days past, but the mornings and evenings are cool. I presume that you have received the letter that I wrote you. I returned to the Grand Duke's courier in which I informed you that my letter of the ninth was the one that I entrusted to General Kohler, which was handed to you. My wife, who has arrived safely, saw Monsieur Maricaldi in Genoa. Madame Brignol's families were all well. Signed Bertrand, Porto Ferrejo, this 9th, August 1814. P.S. The officer who was to take this letter to you has left without coming to my house. I take advantage of Monsieur Urol's departure to send it to you. He is very anxious to see his wife again. We hope to see you in the month of September when Her Majesty has finished taking the waters. This 20th August. The day on which the Empress was to leave for X was approaching. As the young prince was not to accompany his mother on this journey, she sent for Dr. Frank, the Emperor of Austria's doctor, and charged him with the care of her son's health during the child's stay in Vienna. She wrote to the doctor on this matter officially. Napoleon's son left under the vigilant maternal care of Madame de Montesquieu 
remained accordingly with her in Schönbrunn. This young prince, whose birth had been hailed with so many blessings in our country, and who seemed destined for so lofty a future, was not to leave Austria, where he had found a prison for a refuge, whilst awaiting the tomb which was to open so prematurely for him. Two days before the Empress's departure, the Emperor Francis went to the Baden Baths with his family. These baths are situated at a distance of four leagues from Vienna in a pretty valley called St. Helena. Marie Louise went to take leave of him and on her return received almost the entire court which came to take leave of her and in disposition of Madame de Brignoles, which had at first given us some anxiety but which fortunately had no consequences, delayed our departure 24 hours. The Empress of Austria came to Schönbrunn after dinner to say goodbye and to her stepdaughter and only left her after having put her into his carriage. The Empress Marie Louise assumed the name of Duchess de Colorno for this journey, Colorno being one of the pleasure houses of the Duchy of Parma. She traveled without stopping till we reached Morsberg, where we found Monsieur de Bausset, who had preceded us ill with the gout. She stayed one day in this town. The road which she was following obliged her to pass through Munich. She found the Viceroy and the Vice Queen of Italy waiting for her at the stage house, and they took her to sup with them. Madame de Brignol and myself, untidy as we were in our traveling costumes, followed her. We supped at the Viceroy's palace with the Princess Royale of Württemberg, sister of the Vice Queen. This princess, after her separation from the husband whom Napoleon's politics had bestowed upon her, had come to seek comfort with her sister. Providence held a splendid reparation in store for her by placing her a year later on the imperial throne of Austria. Having continued her journey by way of Bern, Payerne, and Chamonix, Marie-Louise reached Aix on July 17th. She was received at Carouge by General Nyperg, who came to meet her on horseback, saluted her at the door of her carriage, and accompanied her to Aix. This was the second time that she saw him. The sight of him created a disagreeable impression on the Empress, which she did not dissimulate. Count Nyperg was not it must be said, particularly well favored. A black bandage covered the deep cicatrice of a wound by which he had lost an eye. But this disadvantage disappeared when one looked at him attentively. This wound rather suited the ensemble of his face, which had a martial character. His hair was of a light blonde color, scanty and curly. His glance was bright and penetrating. His features were neither vulgar nor distinguished. Taken altogether, they betokened a clever and subtle man. His complexion, full colored on the whole, lacked in freshness. It was marked with the impress of the fatigues of war and his numerous wounds. He was of the middle height and well built, and the elegance of his figure was heightened by the loose cut of his Hungarian uniform. General Nyperg was at that time about 42 years old. This man played so important a part in Marie Louise's life and exercised so great an influence on her destiny that I must try and explain what were the qualities with which he won her confidence. His general appearance was an amiable one, mingled with alacrity and gravity. His manners were polite, insinuating, and flattering. He possessed agreeable talents and was a good musician. Active, clever, possessed of little scruple, he knew how to conceal his acuteness under an exterior of simplicity. He expressed himself and wrote with grace. He added to much tact, a spirit of observation, and he knew how to listen. 
listening with studied attention to what was said to him. His face would now assume a caressing expression, and now his glance would seek to fathom the secret thoughts. He was as clever in reading the designs of others as he was prudent in the conduct of his own, adding to the outward signs of modesty and immense vanity and ambition. He never spoke of himself. He was brave in war, and his many wounds show that he had not spared himself. Monsieur Armandi, colonel of the artillery in the Italian army, who acted as minister of war during the troubles in Romagna in 18 blank, had assured me that General Nypert was in Milan in 1814 at the house of a lady whose lover he was when he received notice that he had been selected to reside with the new Duchess of Parma together with his instructions. His mistress tried in vain to keep him back. Ambition was stronger in him than love. This Italian mistress, having asked him what he would do with Marie Louise and whether this new position would at least bring him more forward, Nyberg is said to have answered, I hope to be on the most intimate terms with her before six months are out and soon to be her husband. To complete these data on Nyberg, I must further mention a curious peculiarity of this strange destiny. The Austrian general was the son of a Frenchman, whilst Count Nyberg, the putative father of the general, was filling a diplomatic mission in Paris. He made the acquaintance of a French officer belonging to a distinguished family. He received him with familiarity at his house, and Countess Snyberg did not remain insensible to the merits of Comte de H. Blanc, who repaid her with assiduous attention. An intimacy arose accordingly between the Countess and the young officer, and General Snyberg was a fruit of it. The proof of this fact lies in a letter from Countess Snyberg which was found in the papers left by Count H. Blank after his death. This concatenation of circumstances will afford a fresh subject of reflection to those who admit that fatality always plays some part in human events. Marie-Louise alighted an ex at a house situated outside the town, belonging to a Monsieur de Chevalier. It had been prepared for her reception by care of Monsieur Balouet, the intendant of the Empress's household, and was the same which Queen Hortense had already occupied. The Empress, during my stay in Aix, only received General Nyberg in official audiences. This princess had not yet had time to become German again, and the presence of a few French people who had remained faithful to her cause still attached her. By some ties to France, the Empress found Messieurs Corvissar and Isabelle waiting for her ex. The Duchess de Montebello did not arrive before the beginning of August. I left Marie-Louise on the second day after her arrival at Aix to go and spend the time of a double season at the Springs with my family. The Empress did not neglect means of corresponding with the Emperor, but opportunities became more and more scarce and difficult. She had commissioned Monsieur de Bassay with the letter thinking that he would find facilities in Parma, where she was sending him to forward it to Elba. I extract from the long and numerous letters written to me entirely by the princess herself during the seven weeks that I spent in Paris, the passages which depict the state of her mind as well as her sentiments towards the emperor. I hope that she will pardon me for having published this correspondence during her lifetime. However it may be, I am certain that I have not committed any abuse with this publication of my communications with Parma and the silence that Marie-Louise has observed towards me since the revolution of 1830 prevented me from obtaining the consent from her, which I should have been glad to be in a position to ask for. I am still expecting an answer from my father to know the date of my departure for Parma. I will let you know at once. Though I should be very pleased if you would soon return to me, still I feel how much you must wish to remain a little longer with Madame de Meneval. I am sure it is very unselfish on my part to allow you to do so. Your very affectionate, signed Louise. Second letter, 
August 9th, 1814. I thank you very much for all the trouble you have taken about my boxes. What you write me concerning the remarks of Mr. de Bombell on this subject does not seem to portend much good. I am still in the most painful uncertainty as to my future fate. I sent a letter by Mr. de Caratzai to my father in which I asked him for permission to establish myself at Parma on September 10th at the latest. Will this be granted to me? I fear not. If my presentiment is wrong, I will let you know at once so that you can send for Madame de Meneval and her children. I know that will please you. It will be very hard for you to have to pass the winter without having seen them, and I should be very sorry for you. If the answer is a negative one, I shall never consent to return to Vienna before the departure of the sovereigns, and I shall try to have my son back. I shall establish myself in Geneva or in Parma whilst awaiting the Congress, but it is impossible for me to remain here after the season is over. I cannot tell you with what impatience I am waiting in an answer. I want you to help me with your advice in my determination. Do not be afraid to tell me the truth if my determination appears inconsistent to you. I want your advice as from a friend. I hope you will give me your opinion quite frankly. I have just received a letter from the emperor from the island of Elba dated July 4th. He begs me not to go to X, but to go to Tuscany to take the waters. I shall write about this to my father. You know how anxious I am to do what the emperor wishes. In this case, ought I to do it? If it is not in harmony with my father's intentions, I send you a letter from Porto Ferreo. I was very much tempted to open it. It would have given me some particulars. If it contains any particulars, please let me know them. I thank you very much for those you gave me. I wanted them badly for it was a long time that I have been without news. Generally speaking, I am in a very critical and in a very unhappy condition. My conduct has to be full of prudence. There are some moments when my head is so troubled that I think I best I could do would be to die. My health is fairly good. This is my 10th bath. They would do me good if my mind were easier. I shall not be happy until I have got out of this fatal state of uncertainty. I am very pleased to think that you will soon be here to reason with me and call my poor head. I need it badly. Monsieur de Bosset left some days ago taking with him all the papers which I wanted to see so that I have not been able to examine them with this month's account as I had a wish to do. I am awaiting the couriers which he sent from Parma with impatience. I did not carry out all the extravagances which I planned for the 28th. I had Madame de Brignol to Goutte, but when the moment came for carrying out my plans, I was afraid that they might not be very successful, and so I gave them up. I am sure you will laugh at my cowardice. The account of my journey, which I am writing, has only got as far as my visit to the Busson Glaciers. The other day at the ball, we were speaking about it and about my plan of having it printed. And Madame de Hurl added, yes, with Monsieur de Meneval's little printing press. Somebody whom she did not know said behind her, Monsieur de Meneval has got a printing press? That is worth knowing. Monsieur Hurl informed me of this remark and begged me to let you know of it so that you can get rid of your press as soon as possible or send it to Parma with my carriage. I am told that a very heavy penalty is inflicted on private individuals who are detected with printing presses. Imagine what it would be in your case who had been working so long in the emperor's cabinet. It worries me. I can assure you that I shall not be at ease until I hear you have got rid of it. Your affectionate Marie-Louise. P.S. My son is wonderfully well and gets sweeter every day. According to what they write me, I am very anxious to see the little poor child again.